All right, hello, uh, welcome. Today with us, uh, Donald Robertson. Um, Donald Robertson is very well known in the uh, stoic circles today. Uh, he's a writer, cognitive behavioral uh, psychotherapist and trainer. He's a fellow of the uh, Royal Society for Public Health. He specializes in teaching evidence-based uh, psychological skills and known as an expert on the relationship between modern psychotherapy, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, and classical Greek and Roman philosophy, especially Stoicism, which we will be talking about today. Uh, Donald Robertson is the author of six books and many articles on philosophy, psychotherapy, and psychological skills training. Um, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for joining me today, uh, Donald. Um, let's, uh, let's first talk about your last book. Your okay. last book is uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, right? The Stoicism of uh, Marcus Aurelius, which was very recently translated into Turkish mm -hmm. uh, from Beyaz Baykuşa Yinleri Roma İmparatoru gibi düşünmek. So, why did you write this book? Why do you think the modern audience, us, right? Why, why do you uh -huh. think we should care about this Roman emperor who lived 2000 uh -huh. years ago or 18 centuries ago? Well, First of all, thank you for inviting me to, sure. to take part in this conversation. Um, well, look, you know, I'll tell you exactly how the book ended up being right. I'd written. I, I'd written some books about Stoicism, and then a publisher said to me, would you like to write another book about Stoicism as a, and make a kind of general introduction and talk about CBT? And I thought, yes and no, because uh, I thought there are already lots of introductions mm. to stoicism and I'd already written a book called Stoicism and the Art mm. of Happiness. It was kind of an introduction. So I thought we can't do the same thing again and again. I have to write something different, but mm. that would be an introductory text. So I thought, how can I do that, um, but make it different? And I thought, how would the Stoics do it? And the Stoics like to use examples um, from individuals that they consider role models. So Epictetus, for example, Uh, refers to Romans that he admires. He talks about Socrates and Diogenes the Cynic. Mm -hmm. And so the Stoics believed in using these exemplars uh, for teaching. And uh, so I thought we could use uh, the life of a Stoic. That would be a good way uh, to introduce people to philosophy. And I thought there are many advantages to doing that. So one of them is, and we'll probably come back to this later, that there are certain common misconceptions about Stoicism. And I realized just from my experience, and I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of experience of talking to people about stoicism and speaking at conferences and things. I realized that when we point at a real stoic, it becomes more obvious that some of the common misconceptions don't apply. Um, and those are things like stoics would just be passive and mm. they would stay at home and do nothing. Marcus Aurelius was very active and very courageous, and very self-disciplined, so the opposite of what this misconception would make a story out to be. And so it's easier in a way to address some of those misconceptions by using examples, uh, rather than just debating about what the philosophy may or may not teach, although we can do that as well. And uh, I also thought stories are also more engaging uh, for many people and they reach a, a wider audience, a different audience from academic textbooks. And uh, my, I have a young daughter and she was about five or six years old at the time. And I used to tell her lots of stories about Greek mythology. And I started telling her stories about Socrates and Diogenes the Cynic and about the Stoics. Mm. And I thought, wow, if I can tell my six-year-old daughter some of these anecdotes and she kind of understands them and relates to them, then you know, maybe these are quite powerful ways of teaching people about philosophy. And Um, nowadays, we, we think of ancient philosophy as being taught through letters and dialogues, but actually ancient philosophy was also transmitted through many, many anecdotes. And a good example would be Diogenes the Cynic, we know virtually nothing about except through anecdotes about mm -hmm. him. And in fact, we have this book by Diogenes Laertius, The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, which is really just packed with anecdotes about the lives of ancient philosophers. So in the ancient world, one of the main ways of teaching about philosophy was to tell little stories about the, the mm -hmm. lives of its proponents. Mm -hmm. So I thought, um, okay, let's do that and we'll write a book that focuses on the life of a Stoic. <clears throat> Who would be the most obvious person? Zeno, the first Stoic. Yeah. And I thought there are some good stories about Zeno, but I thought there aren't enough of them perhaps, uh, for this book that I was envisaging, uh, mm -hmm. to fill the whole book in the way that I wanted to, almost, but not quite. 
So then I thought, well, is there a, a Stoic about whom we know more than Zeno? And then I thought, yes, not the first famous Stoic of antiquity, but the last famous Stoic of antiquity, someone who died about almost five centuries after the Stoic school was founded, and that would be Marcus Aurelius, for the reason that, as I like to put it, he was a big deal back in the day, he, because he was a Roman emperor. We know more about the life and character of Marcus Aurelius than we do, in fact, about most ancient philosophers, because he was famous for other reasons. And in fact, many people underestimate how much we know about Marcus Aurelius. Um, but we have three major surviving histories of his reign. We have lots of other references to him. We have archaeological evidence that relates to his life. And so we know a lot more about him than we do about uh, any of the other Stoics. And so it was possible to write a whole book about him and also tell people things that maybe that many of them had overlooked. And so that was how I, I came to, to write this book. Mm -hmm. And I also realized Marcus Aurelius, in a sense, is the most popular of the Stoics. He's the, the most widely read of the ancient Stoics mm -hmm. today. And his book, The Meditations, is, in a sense, more personal um, than the other surviving Stoic texts or most philosophical texts because it's, it's private reflections. And the first chapter of that book is entirely consists of his reflections and the qualities he most admires in his, members of his family and his tutors. So it, it's kind of autobiographical in a sense, uh, uh, the first chapter at least, it tells us about the people that he admires. So it gives a good basis for talking about what we know about his external behavior and life from the Roman histories, and also talking about what his internal psychological and philosophical journey from his private notes in the meditations. And so I thought it'd be good if we could figure out a way to connect the inner and outer story of his life and relate his personal philosophical reflections to some of the events that were told took place in his life. Wow. And so that all these ideas came together for me, and it, it was quite a challenge, actually, because in addition to understanding the philosophy, I had to connect it to uh, evidence-based or research-based ideas in modern psychotherapy, yeah. and I had to try and give an accurate account of these historical anecdotes and their historical context, and uh, make all these things kind of connected together so it was quite an ambitious project in a sense yeah. um, and uh, but I very much enjoyed doing it and that is how that book came to be written. Yeah and uh, you do something very interesting in this book actually so you first talk about the history and you give us the history and then you you uh, and also you use the meditations of course a lot and his own uh, reflections on his own thinking and his own life and then you give us some ideas about how to practice those things how we can apply uh, what he did to our own lives. Uh -huh. right? That's the structure of the book. Yeah, so one thing though, so this person, Marcus Aurelius, he was a Roman emperor, okay? Uh, when he was alive, when he was an emperor, he was the most you know, powerful person, right, alive. Mm -hmm. um, he was very well educated from top yes. teachers of his time, yes. right? And this meditations, this book is a private journal, actually. He wrote yes. it for himself as a stoic practice, which we will talk about stoic practice. The, the journaling was itself a stoic practice, right? He was reminding himself about, or he was, uh, you know, uh, thinking about his own life and examining his own life now. So this book, the, the meditations, and he didn't mm -hmm. expect anyone else to read it, right? So mm -hmm. he ordered his servant to just, you know, destroy it, but he didn't. So now this book called Meditations, is a book that is written by a Roman for a Roman, yeah. emperor, right? Now, is it so? When people read this book, Marx will say something like this, for example: mm -hmm. um, "Stop theorizing about what a good man is. Be one." Yes. Now, but he has spent years about theorizing. Yes, he has. He is a practicing Stoic, and now he says to himself, "Okay, so." Uh -huh. You see the possible problem there? So how much yes. we can uh, apply this, this book to our own lives? Well, like you said, actually, I, I'll, I'll mention something that might interest people. This is, I guess, to some extent, informed speculation on my part. Um, the, all modern scholars agree that we're 99% sure that this was never meant for publication. And it's fairly safe to say it really doesn't look like it was meant to be published for a number of reasons. Now, ironically, as an aside, one of our other main sources is Seneca, who writes primarily letters 
Yeah. And Seneca's letters very much look as if they were intended for publication. Yeah. Um, so kind of the opposite of, of Marcus Aurelius. And uh, I think, I'm cautious about saying this, but I think when we're reading Marcus Aurelius, in part because these are private notes to himself, we have to be uh, careful not to take some of his comments too literally. And actually, I think this is true of Epictetus as well. Mm -hmm. So I think we, the Meditations is a beautiful text and we can get a great deal from reading it in isolation. And so many people actually get kind of annoyed when uh, classicists and philosophers say that they should read commentaries on the meditations. They say, why should I read all this stuff from modern authors? I can just get everything I need from the meditations. But I think there are problems in doing that. Hmm. You can get a lot by doing that. But sometimes we need to place Marcus's comments within the wider philosophical framework, the context. He, meditations is not a textbook on Stoic philosophy. It doesn't explain Stoic philosophy from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really have an ancient text that does that. In fact, the closest we have is a book by Cicero called De Finibus that consists in a kind of lecture or an explanation of Stoic ethics. Marcus isn't trying to do that, so he takes many ideas for granted. Other things he kind of simplifies or overstates at times. Um, he's not trying to lay things out accurately. He's trying to express them in a concise and a motivating way for his own psychological benefit. So I'll say, I'll give, it, I'll give you one explanation of that. I, it seems to me historically that Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, he were told he trained in the Cynic School of Philosophy. I believe that in the ancient world, the, it was widely perceived that the Cynics in particular and the followers of Plato in particular represented two contrasting views about what it means to be a philosopher as a way of life. So the Platonists were more academic, as we say today, and they were highly theoretical, uh, very bookish and scholarly. And the cynics were much more concerned about developing their character and kind of sneered, uh, in a sense, of bookishness in the study of logic and metaphysics and so on, which they kind of believed was, was irrelevant. We we're told Diogenes, the cynic, kind of made fun of, of Plato. Now, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, was originally a cynic. And then later he went off to study in many other schools of philosophy, but predominantly in the academic school of philosophy. And I think Zeno in many ways was an eclectic and he sought to bring together influences from various Athenian schools of philosophy. Most of them, uh, in fact, most of the major schools, in fact, even some that aren't well known today, like the Megarian school, for instance. One interpretation of that is that he, he was perhaps mainly studying schools of philosophy that descended from Socrates, almost as if he was trying to reconstruct the original mm -hmm. philosophy of Socrates, perhaps in some regards. Um, and I think Zeno perhaps may have looked at the cynics and the academics and thought, maybe there's an element of truth in both, and maybe there's a middle way. And Zeno's middle way to me would have been and I think this is something that the Stoics would have was said in general, um, that we should study logic and we should study metaphysics and so on, study nature, only insofar as it contributes to improving our character. Mm -hmm. And that to study logic in an overly academic way might actually become a vice and it might be a distraction from improving our, our character. So over bookishness, or over uh, abstractness uh, might actually become a form of folly or vice um, if we're not careful. Um, but equally, turning our nose up at logic and metaphysics so on and trying to make a virtue out of ignorance might be foolish and a bad idea. But we have to see study of these fields as something that, that's subordinated to a more fundamental goal, which is improving our character. So when Marcus Aurelius says, put away your books, I do not think um, it makes sense to interpret him as like a cynic just thumbing his nose uh, all study, because he dedicated decades to studying philosophy and he continued to study uh, philosophy. He was highly educated uh, in general, uh, particularly in different schools of philosophy. But I think what he means is that he shouldn't, he has a natural tendency uh, to become quite bookish. He was a bit of a nerd. He was one of the biggest nerds in history in a way. He's a big philosophy nerd. Um, and he's trying to rein that in 
and he's saying to himself, look, you know, maybe you're getting too into your books mm -hmm. and sometimes you need to step back from that and focus. And he's overstating that in his writings to himself. But I think it clearly doesn't mean, it would be inconsistent with everything else that we know about his life to interpret him as meaning that he should completely abandon his studies. Um, you know, it, it seems more uh, consistent with what we know about him to say that he's simply urging himself to moderate his uh, love of books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to point out the, the, the danger of just, you know, uh, focusing on one sentence from a philosopher in isolation yes. from the, the, the overall philosophy under the, the, the book and just uh, without the context interpreted in the way that we would interpret some modern person would say, right, right that kind of a thing. Because so, so the way I understand is because that is one of the most frequently used quotations from Marcus mm -hmm. Aurelius, right? Stop theorizing about being a good person, be a good person. But then we can also understand this, which uh, as, as a principle for ourselves, do not wait until figuring out completely what a good person would be in order yeah. to start becoming one. Just start now. And then actually that, and that is, I think, a very important uh, stoic approach. The practice will also tell you about what a mm -hmm. good person would be, right? You will better understand the yeah. good person as you become one more and more. From practice, definitely. And of course, the meditations itself, which is engaged in writing, uh, yeah. you know, is he's studying and theorizing and arguing about what it means to be a good person. So it's strange because it would appear to clash with the very activity that he's engaged in. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess you could also say that the Stoics see studying philosophy as kind of a, mean, a means to the end of becoming a good person. Mm -hmm. And we just have to be cautious, like many activities in life, that we don't forget about the end and start to treat the study of philosophy mm -hmm. of bookishness as if it was an end in itself, that we keep our... He's always, throughout the meditations, one of his main themes is to, to constantly drag himself back to focusing on the fundamental goal. He thinks we have an... He clearly thinks that we have a natural tendency to forget our purpose in life, to forget our fundamental goal and become distracted by uh, the activities we're engaged in, stop treating them as if they were an end in themselves. And uh, I think he's, he's probably right about that. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, th there are, so, so, um, there are many groups now, right? Online groups and non-online groups about stoicism, uh, it is on the rise. Um, well, so we have this ancient ancient stoicism, and there is mm -hmm. you know uh, early, middle, late stoa, and then we have uh, neo stoicism, which is more Christian Renaissance, mm -hmm. and now it is called by some people fifth stoa, right? We have the fifth stoa, we have modern stoicism. Now, what makes a philosophy of life stoicism? So, what is the common thing among all these yeah. different stoicisms? Well, luckily. Um, the Stoics, the ancient Stoics actually defined the, the essence of their philosophy. They did it in a slightly cryptic way. Um, so they define ancient schools of philosophy to some extent were distinguished by their definition of the telos or the goal of life. So we might almost say how they define the meaning of life, or the purpose of life. And for the Stoics, the goal of life is the attainment of arity or virtue, which actually they perceived as a kind of moral wisdom. They perceived it in, in a, a kind of intellectual uh, way. So you could also say the goal of life for Stoics is a kind of moral wisdom, very much as it was for Socrates before them. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's what really uh, makes Stoicism Stoicism. Other schools of philosophy also made uh, moral wisdom important, like the academics, for example. But for the Stoics, it's, in a sense, the only truly important thing. They adopt a harder line. And that's sometimes expressed, for example, by Cicero, as saying that the Stoic school taught that virtue is the only true good mm -hmm. and everything else, in a sense, is neutral or different, at least with regard to the, the ultimate goal of life. And that's what makes a Stoic a Stoic, arguably. I mean, Stoicism was a big, complicated, multifaceted philosophy. Um, they had theological doctrines that were fairly consistent, although I, I believe they were non-essential. There's some debate about that, but it seems to me that uh, the Stoics tolerated disagreement about theological views. Um, some people don't think that they 
we did. I think the Stoics were reasonably flexible in this regard. There's some evidence that, that there were Stoics, important Stoics, that rejected uh, aspects of the, the theology, such as the, the pantheism and so on. And I think these things were very important to them, but the, the essential part of philosophy was this doctrine that virtue mm. is the only true good. And uh, by the way, I think an illustration of that is the fact that uh, Epictetus greatly admires and holds up his role models, individuals um, who he considers wise and virtuous, but who didn't agree with Stoic mm. theology and didn't study Stoic logic. Um, for example, Socrates, and Diogenes the Cynic. Um, but he's happy to hold them up as exemplars because they hold very similar views about the fundamental uh, importance of moral virtue in life. And so it's not, his main thing isn't to say, look, you know, the people you should be emulating are pantheists, are, are people who hold our theological doctrines. His focus is elsewhere. Mm. Clearly, his focus is on um, their belief in the central importance of virtue. He thinks that's what we should be learning from previous philosophers and emulating from them. And so I think that's what the Stoics considered the essence of their teaching. Okay. Um, and we may today, we don't know as much about some other aspects of philosophy, such as that we know some things about their logic and their theology. Some of it's going to seem out of date to, to modern uh, students or inaccessible to them. Uh, um, but so most modern students of Stoicism are focused mainly on Stoic ethics. Yeah, but so, some people say, um, okay, so the main thing, the, the essence of uh, Stoicism is about the ethics part, right? So they had logic, they had physics, yeah. uh, the ethics part. Um, and the logic part, which is about this um, you know, more therapeutic part uh, that our judgments, they base yeah. on emotions, that part would also, would, wouldn't you agree that that is also like essential for uh, Stoic philosophy? Well, the, I would say there are aspects. Like there are, the Stoics said the um, the Stoics, like other uh, ancient schools of philosophy, the Stoics divided their curriculum um, into three main areas, we should say. We're assuming that, so we've clarified for the viewers, uh, logic, uh, ethics, and what they call physics, which we might also call metaphysics, it also includes theology. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say there are probably aspects of each of those. There are certainly aspects of Stoic logic and Stoic physics that are overlapping with their ethics uh, and perhaps are more important from that point of view than others. Um, so, you know, there are parts of Stoic logic, for example, that we know they wrote books about, that were very important to them, uh, that consist in dealing with logical paradoxes. Um, which like, are arguably not as central to us today, although they were very, very much of interest to ancient Stoic logicians. But there may be other aspects of what they would consider logic. Their, their definition of logic is slightly broader than what we think of as formal logic, and it would include um, theory of knowledge and certain psychological principles as well. So their ideas... Um, for example, uh, about the nature of thought um, and how our values interact with our emotions might fall under the broad heading of logic. And that would be important to ethics. It would be part of what we might call moral psychology mm -hmm. today. And so I, these, these different fields probably overlap to some extent. Mm -hmm. we can, I don't think we can draw a sharp dividing line between them. Yeah. Um, but there are parts of their logic that are probably non-essential from yeah. a modern point of view. And there are probably parts of the theology that, that are as well. For example, the Stoics wrote extensively about uh, divination. Um, and modern readers probably don't agree with that or see that as integral. Um, although some people may think that their vision of the universe, uh, their kind of holistic view, or their pantheism might be of more relevance. Um, but even there, uh, I think, some modern followers of Stoicism would accept that and others might reject it. Yeah, yeah. But it, it might have more obvious moral implications than other aspects of their theology. Yeah, so um, historically, they argued that virtue, right, living in accordance with nature, right, virtue uh, is the purpose of life, right, based on our rational uh, nature, rational and social. 
Uh, but then why is rationality that important? Because uh, they said, because the universe is rational, right? Because yeah. the law. Uh, so they, their theology seems to, for ancient Stoics, yes. their theology seems to be essential for their ethics in the oh. sense that it grounds the importance of virtue. Yes. So, but in modern Stoics, not so much. Yes. Now that's an interesting, but although, and we should also say something that we're maybe assuming, which uh, is that the, a surprising number of modern followers of Stoicism are atheists, are agnostics. In fact, the majority of them are, even though the ancient Stoics place quite a lot of emphasis on theology, Stoicism today particularly appeals to agnostics and atheists. And many people will see that they see Stoicism, perhaps ironically, as a secular alternative to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Very interesting way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the, this question of whether Stoic ethics requires belief in providence mm -hmm. is a, a common one. I don't know that it does any more than any ethical theory does. So people in general who believe in a provident deity will often say that this provides an essential way mm -hmm. to ground their ethical principles. This would be true of, of uh, Christians today, for example, or uh, Muslims or you know, people of, of, of many different faiths will often argue that they find it seems inconceivable to them yeah. to, to justify any ethic on uh, hum a humanistic or an atheistic uh, basis. That, they, that seems self-evident to them that you need providence to uh, base an ethic. Whereas atheists and agnostics will disagree with that. And they'll say, no, we think you can find possibly a justification um, for different moral philosophies uh, based on uh, secular principles. Now, I don't know, I can't give an answer to that because I think that in a sense that's still a raging debate, uh, but I do not think it's a foregone conclusion that you have to believe in providence in order to arrive at these ethical principles. And I don't think this is necessarily any more of a problem for the Stoics than it is for adherents of any other uh, ethical uh, position, uh, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. And also, I would say that the ancient Stoics do not solely depend on arguments of a theological nature to justify their ethic. They do propose other types of ethical argument. In fact, it seems to me that they relatively seldom try to use providence as a justification for their ethical position. Um, they are... Uh, they're more likely, it seems to me, to use other types of arguments. Um, for example, they, they'll often argue um, that because we're thinking beings, we're inherently rational beings, that we're already committed, in a sense, to the value of reason, and that really uh, we're just not consistent in doing that. And that if we were more consistent in following through on our pre-existing commitment to thinking mm -hmm. rationally, then we would be not only thinking uh, by means of reason, but thinking uh, well and thinking wisely. And if we did that in all areas of life, we would be virtuous. So I, I think uh, the, the Stoics sometimes show signs that they're trying to develop a justification for their ethic um, based on the, the analysis of, of pure reason. Uh, and often it's got to do in a kind of from a Socratic perspective in identifying inconsistencies. Um, so the Stoics will talk about how uh, we admire certain qualities or virtues in other people. Um, and they'll often point out that we don't try to embody those values ourselves. So they'll suggest that well, you're already committed to these values, but you're simply mm -hmm. not applying consistently to your own life. So the, the argument from providence, um, I don't think is their only whether these other arguments are successful or not would be a different question. Um, but they, they, it's not the only way that they try to justify their ethic. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think you have to believe in a provident God in order to mm -hmm. agree with what the Stoics are saying. Okay, because one, one question, for example, when, I'm, when I teach um, Stoicism in introduction, in the introductory course, uh, one question from students is, okay, so they talk about nature. Uh, and living in accordance with nature is the basis of it, right? And they interpret it as virtue, which is Zeno, for example, said uh, happiness is a good flow of life, right? So the flow and uh, being in accordance with nature. Uh, all right, but then the the uh, 
then they also say something about human nature and then rationality and our social social aspect of our nature becomes important. However, one question from my students, this is a very common question is, well, there are other things in our nature. So now they are using the term differently. Yes. They're like anger, like selfishness, like you know, things like that can also be yes. in our nature, right? So when we uh -huh. look at human nature and then we say, this part is important, not this part, then I mm -hmm. see, okay, but this part conforms with the universe. This part doesn't. Yeah, so this is, that's, that's one point of view. Um, but I think in the Stoic literature, we can find a different line of argument, mm -hmm. um, which is that, so they, they refer to reason as the hegemonicon, mm -hmm. uh, which we roughly translate as the kind of ruling faculty, the master mm -hmm. faculty. And uh, they have a great deal to say about it the importance of this faculty of reason and why they think it's so central, why they define human nature in terms of it. And one of those reasons is that um, unlike most other animals, uh, humans are able to reflect upon their instincts, drives and desires. Mm -hmm. So if I have an itch on my skin, say a child has chicken pox and their skin is very itchy, they may have an overwhelming urge to scratch mm -hmm. that itch. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also capable of reflecting and learning and gaining information from other people. And they may learn that even though they have a strong desire to scratch the edge, it'd be a really bad idea to do that because it might make the, the, the condition worse, it might damage their skin. So sometimes we're able to take a step back and look at our animal nature or our instincts or drives and question them or resist them. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Stoics think the hegemonicon, a ruling faculty, is a ruling faculty. It's kingly in a sense, because it's able to pass judgment on all of our other inclinations and drives in a way that, that we have a sort of self-awareness, a self-consciousness that's capable of being self-critical mm -hmm. in a way that most other animal species don't really seem capable of doing. And uh, the Stoics acknowledge that we have these other drives and appetites and so on, but they believe that in this crucial respect, they're all subordinated to reason Mm -hmm. um, because reason is, is capable of passing judgment on the value of them all mm -hmm. by self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what makes us human is that uh, ruling faculty, right? So rationality. So uh, living a uh, full human life requires a, a, a rational life. Sometimes I give an example like, so this is also kind of Aristotelian, uh, rational animal uh, kind of, so what's important is... Um, if we are not, if we do not live by our rationality, it's like sometimes I give this example in my classes, uh, like a, an eagle refusing to fly, for example, right? So uh -huh. that's not an, an eagle's life, right? If the, the eagle refuses, so refusing to think, re refusing to live an examined rational life is like, you know, would be like that. So it's uh, deficient. That's the idea, I guess, right? Okay, and yeah, so we can examine our lives and we use our rationality when we examine our, our lives and our own instincts and all that, so yeah. Uh, yeah, and reason might tell us whether our fears or desires are justified or not, or whether they're healthy or unhealthy. So reason is capable of evaluating every other aspect of our nature in a, in a sense. And the stories therefore compare it to a king ruling over a, a, a court. Um, and assigning value to, to everything else. That's why they think it's central um, and uh, it defines the significance of everything else about our nature. Um, and so it might be that we decide to follow our instincts in a situation, but we it would be reason that tells us whether it's a good idea or a bad idea to do that. Yeah, that, that term nature, I think, creates some confusion in general. Uh, you know, because in some sense it is... So natural and biological are different things, right? In stoic uh, jargon. Uh, so sometimes we confuse those things and it creates a confusion when we are reading these uh, stoic texts. I think even the ancient stoics realized that this was kind of paradoxical and, con and a confusing way of phrasing things because most mm -hmm. people assume that human nature is, is kind of animalistic in a sense mm -hmm. or that they have a, a tendency for some reason to view it that way. Um, mm. the, the, the Stoics, Stoicism is a philosophy built on paradoxes. And I think one of the paradoxes is that following nature really means the opposite of what, what most people yeah. assume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so I have gathered some questions from the audience before our uh, talk. So I would like to ask one of them now. Um, 
So here's one question. I received by email. Uh, mm -hmm. Classicists have commented on the fact that the popularity of Stoicism came in two waves. One of the uh, one as the Greek states uh, came under the thrall of Macedon and later Rome, and one mm -hmm. when the Roman Republic gave way to empire. Is the current popularity of Stoicism also a symptom of de declining faith in public institutions? Gosh, I mean, in that historical analysis, I'm not. Uh, certain of it, it, it, certainly the stoicism arose um, in the wake um, of the, the the kind of fragmentation of the Alexander the Great's empire. Um, the, whether, to, whether stoicism rose or fell in popularity, it's quite difficult to trace. It became popular in Rome, um, but we have such little evidence, it's kind of hard to quantify, you know, to draw a line graph and say this is how stoicism's popularity goes up and down. Um, it was popular for approximately 500 years. If there were low points or high points in that, I think that's a little bit harder to, to really be accurate about. Um, disillusionment, I do think there's a sense in which um, Stoicism, maybe, and maybe other philosophies, answer uh, a disillusionment um, that is often associated with perhaps exposure. So it, historically, when people are exposed to ideas from other cultures, mm -hmm. they often that leads to a kind of disillusionment with institutions in their own society. So for example, you know, if you're brought up in a society and it has a certain religious outlook, and that's all you've known your entire life, it's harder to question it or think outside it. But if you travel the world or you meet traders from all over the world and, and you think, hang on a minute, these people believe in other gods or they have a completely different religious outlook, that's inevitably going to make you begin questioning some of the religious dogmas of your society and some of the moral values that are uh, taken for granted in your society. And then you're probably uh, going to start to feel a little bit lost because you're going to think, well, should I be worshipping Jesus or Krishna or, you know, which of these gods am I, is the right one? And it's confusing and overwhelming. And, uh, you know, the exposure to other societies and cultures that comes with the expansion of empire and trade could be compared to the internet. Um, and now, you know, we're bombarded with uh, an excessive amount of information today. And I think people find it overwhelming and disorientating. They don't know who or what to believe anymore. And uh, Stoicism offers a way for people to find a kind of sense of purpose, sense of direction, a moral compass amid all that confusion. It also provides psychological techniques, which we'll come to, that might help people to deal with alarming or distressing information, particularly about global issues that might be beyond their direct control. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people have a sense of powerlessness, perhaps, um, when they're part of a large state and they're getting news from all over the world that might be shocking or frightening. And we get that today uh, with the internet. We're bombarded with uh, information. People are more scared now than they ever were in the recent past. Um, even though we we're told in many societies crime rates are going down, anxiety about crime is going up. Mm. And that's often attributed to the fact that the, media, the news media in particular are becoming more and more alarmist mm. in terms of the rhetoric that they employ in order to get attention from their audience. And so people tell me today that they feel that stoicism helps them psychologically to cope with um, the rhetoric. Um, I, I used to believe Socrates and the Stoics talk a lot about the problem of sophists. Um, these ancient orators and rhetoricians who tried to whip up the emotions uh, of crowds in the ancient world. And I thought that's really interesting, but it's kind of a historical curiosity because we don't have sophists as such anymore. I guess we have personal development gurus and politicians and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then I, it suddenly hit me one day that, in fact, we have something that fills a very similar purpose to the sophists in our society, but it's not a person or an individual as such. It's social media in general is like a big sophist. Um, the sophists were criticized by Socrates in particular for saying whatever they thought would win them the biggest round of applause. So Socrates said, you guys have a vested interest in saying 
things that appeal to an audience, regardless of whether it's actually true or false or rational or irrational. And you literally compete with one another and win prizes for who gives the best speech. And so you're uh, incentivized to say whatever whips up the audience and, and gets them most excited, even you know if it's not true or if it's uh, exaggerated. And that's how the internet works. You know, the posts and articles and messages that come across social media that reach the most people, the ones that are rewarded, are the ones that get the highest levels of engagement. And that may be the ones that are most alarmist and least realistic or rational. Uh, reason isn't necessarily rewarded with exposure, uh, but highly emotive content is. So social media is really geared up to whip up and distort people's emotions in, in much the way that the office were. Because um, rhetoric, emotive rhetoric gains attention mm -hmm. and it, it easily drowns out sober, rational discussion. Mm -hmm. And that, that was true in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, and, and it's perhaps even more true today. So people are, are feel a frustration with that, and they see philosophy, perhaps particularly ancient philosophy, as a way of life. And Stoicism in particular is, is perhaps a way of defending themselves against the manipulation that they're exposed to from news media and social media today. Oh, yeah. So, so we we we said then the the about this psychological strength, right? So, uh, stoicism has this uh, very important aspect. Um, so they say they are they say we should minimize pathos, right? So, so pathé. So, um, and then in, in, based on the Latin root, people translate this in English uh, passion, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we shouldn't have passions. But now that sounds like we shouldn't care about anything, right? So we shouldn't have passion. Yeah. Okay. So is that it? So what, what is this, uh, the pathos? Uh, well, actually, the, the Stoics think that we, uh, I said, I've said in the past, and people are often surprised when I said this, or shocked even when I said this, that I said, I think Stoic philosophy is a philosophy of love. It's, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, all about a particular type of, of love. And I, the clue is in the name, uh, philosophy, which, of course, uh, means a particular type of love for wisdom. How could the Stoics mean that we should be completely uncaring and indifferent when they never stop going on and on and on and on about the importance of the love of wisdom? And they, they mean that quite literally. To us, philosophy is just a, a word. It's a piece of jargon now. It's lost its original meaning. But to the Greeks and to the Romans who spoke Greek and wrote in Greek, philosophy meant very much the love of wisdom. They took that quite literally. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Aurelius clearly is a man who loves and admires and cherishes wisdom uh, and makes a, a, a priority in his life. It's, it's almost a religious calling to him. And so it would be absurd to, to think of him as being someone who's completely aloof and indifferent. Um, it's quite the opposite. In a sense, you could say he's a very passionate man. He, he's, he's passionate about the pursuit of wisdom. And, and so was Socrates before him, in a sense. Um, and in fact, the Stoics, there are some problems of translation and quirks of the, the language. For example, the Stoics also have this technical term, eupathei, uh, which means healthy passions or good passions. And Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca talk repeatedly about joy, cheerfulness, love, friendship, and even healthy forms of aversion, like we would describe as having a kind of conscience about things or aversion to vice, for instance. So there are many healthy emotions that they talk about mm -hmm. uh, and think of as important and rational. What they're really talking about, and then there's a passage actually at the beginning of the meditations where Marcus describes one of his Stoic teachers as being free from passions, by which he means the irrational, unhealthy, or excessive passions, mm -hmm. free from passions and yet full of love. Mm. What he actually uses instantly is philostorgia, which means uh, sometimes translated as natural affection. It's the kind of the love that a parent would have for children, mm. uh, philanthropic or brotherly love, you might say. Um, so being free from passion and yet full of love is the, the stoic ideal as far as Marcus Aurelius is concerned. And so it's having the right type of passions. It's having healthy passions. And Seneca also, when he talks about stoicism, struggles with the, inter the translation of the Greek word into Latin. And he chooses to uh, focus, the, there's a double meaning to the word pathos. On the one hand, it's the root of our word passion, but it's also the root of our word pathological. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a psychotherapist, so psychotherapists deal with psychopathology 
and uh, unhealthy pathological emotions. Mm -hmm. And so Cicero actually focuses on this, uh, the meaning of the word as referring to distress or disease or pathology. Um, so it's really, this, what the Stoics are saying is that we should uh, become more aware of certain excessive, irrational or unhealthy emotions mm -hmm. and transform them into or replace them with more healthy, proportionate and rational ones. Yeah, so the, um, this pathological or unhealthy or irrational uh, emotions, um, anger, for example, right? So they talk about anger a lot. Uh, we can say anxiety, stress, you know, that, those kinds of things. Um, now, some psychologists say, though, well, they are useful, though, right? We need them. So uh, to a degree, not extensive, to a degree. So for example, they say things like, and I have talked to some psychologists and they said that to me, uh, if you don't feel any anxiety, then you wouldn't take anything seriously, one thing. Or if you don't get angry, then you will not stand up for your, you know, for... Uh, yeah. Now, this is a problem. Our, um, let me take a little sidestep for a moment and say, one of the things I think that philosophy, philosophy of psychology teaches us is that we're, in a sense, we're all philosophers. Like, we all have a philosophy of mind that we take for granted every day. It's embedded in the language that we use already, whether we like it or not. So some people would say, in a sense, we're all Cartesians. Why? Because the language that we use and the assumptions that we make are kind of Cartesian. And in philosophy, we question that, but it's embedded in our culture to some extent. It's hard not to be Cartesian because our, our language is prejudiced in favour of a mind-body uh, dualism, just the way we talk about things. And uh, we have a, what psychology is sometimes called a, a folk psychology. We have a philosophy of mind, um, which is embedded in the English language, or Turkish language, or whichever language that, that we use. And it's a very, the, when we inspect it closely, it transpires that it's a very crude and simplistic model of how the mind functions. Surprisingly poor quality, um, uh, very rough, uh, inaccurate uh, model of the mind. And so when we talk about emotions in particular, we have a very inadequate, very simplistic emotional vocabulary. So in some languages, there'll be distinctions that aren't in other languages and so on. Ancient Greeks in particular combined emotional concepts that we would separate uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, we all have rather simplistic models. Now, in modern psychology, it's actually very important sometimes for practical purposes to make distinctions that are not normally made in the English language or other modern languages. And one of them would be between the involuntary and the voluntary aspects of an emotion. So any emotion we could look at and say it consists of cognitive, affective, volitional, uh, or behavioral components. We could carve it up in different ways. If I'm frightened, uh, that might consist of a combination of things. It might consist of me believing that something dangerous is about to happen. It might consist of me saying stuff to myself about it. It might consist of my heart beating fast and my muscles tensing and adrenaline being produced in my body. And it might consist of an action tendency or an urge to flee the situation or defend myself. And so when we talk about fear, we usually have this kind of jumbled idea of all these things mixed together somehow and we don't really clearly separate them, but they're arguably different ingredients. I say anxiety is like a cake that's baked from lots of different ingredients. It's not just one homogenous thing. It's a complex thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the most useful distinctions to make is that some of those ingredients are under voluntary control and some of them are reflex-like, automatic and involuntary. Um, there are automatic thoughts that pop into our mind when uh, we are faced with a threat, that this flash into our mind. Um, our unconscious uh, beliefs are activated in response to certain threats. But then there are also things that we say to ourselves voluntarily, usually a moment later. And all of these combine to make up the experience of fear. So the Stoics were way ahead of their time in that they actually made some of these more fine-grained, nuanced uh, distinctions. And uh, the Stoics 
even have a name for the involuntary aspects of emotion. They call them propathei, or the uh, proto passions, or Seneca calls them the first movements of passion. Mm -hmm. And the Stoics say we should learn to accept these involuntary uh, components. So if someone comes up behind you and goes, boo, um, your heart will start racing and you'll maybe jump, like you exhibit what we um, call the startle reflex. And the Stoics would say that's natural and it's inevitable. We share that reflex with animals and should, you should accept it as morally indifferent. But what matters is what you do next. Do you continue to worry about it? Um, do you ruminate about it? Do you add value judgments to it that make it worse than it was even to begin with? And that's something that we might be able to exert wisdom with over and voluntary control over. Um, the, the example that Epictetus gives is that, uh, if, or sorry, I should say another, uh, a, a Roman author called Aulus Gellius tells a story um, about a Stoic philosopher who quotes Epictetus. And the example he gives is that this other philosopher was in a storm in a ship at sea. And Aulus Gellius said to him, you look scared, but you're a Stoic. Are oh, Stoics not meant to be unemotional? And this guy says, no, the Stoics teach that it's natural in the face of danger to experience an automatic uh, anxiety, level of anxiety. Um, even an experienced seaman, he says, would turn pale and, sh and tremble in a ship caught in the middle of a storm where he believed that they were all about to be dashed against the rocks and killed at any moment. Uh, of course, but he says the difference is that a stoic doesn't uh, run around uh, complaining about it and ruminating on it and worrying about it and making it even worse than it, than it was already. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, uh, the stoics have this more slightly more nuanced uh, view, which happens to be very similar to the modern research based model that's used in cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. And can we say that we don't really need, according to stoics, the more cognitive uh, aspect of this uh, negative feelings or uh, this pathological emotions, like for example, anxiety. Uh, if I have a job interview tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I can judge whether that is an important thing or not, right? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, like Stoics said, well, uh, if it is an important thing, which in their terminology, I preferred indifferent, right? So mm -hmm. uh, even though it is not in my control, I would prefer it. Uh, mm -hmm. So then I can choose to work for it. And yeah. for this, I do not need to be anx anxious about it. Yeah. I can just, with my rationality, I can choose. And the Stoics also said, and Socrates as well, said something that was way ahead of its time. And this is like many of the best arguments. This is a very, very simple argument and a very powerful one. Now, this is a perennial debate that, that people... Perhaps Aristotle was the first, uh, to, among the first, to say that there's a useful type of anger, for instance. Mm -hmm. And people make the same argument, as you said, about anxiety. Maybe there's a useful type of anxiety. Mm -hmm. But there's a problem with that view. There are many problems with it. But one very obvious problem, um, which the Stoics knew, and which Socrates also alludes to in Plato's Republic, uh, and which psychologists today are very aware of, which is that when people experience strong emotions, such as anger or anxiety, their brain works differently mm -hmm. in many respects, which are measurable. And one of them is that we exhibit many cognitive and attentional biases, as psychologists say. So someone who's angry, for example, will tend to underestimate risk. They'll mm -hmm. tend to think in terms of sweeping generalizations. They'll tend to jump prematurely to conclusions. Mm -hmm. And overall, their problem-solving ability will be significantly impaired because anger changes the way that their brain works in, in many specific ways. And so you might say, well, anger can help to motivate you. But the price you pay for that is that it also makes you stupider, in a sense, or, or less capable to engage in complex problem solving. And that's most noticeable when the problems that we're dealing with are interpersonal or social problems, because those are some of the most complex, uh, subtle problems that we have to deal with. So the example I would give is if you're mending a broken tap, a leaking tap, and you hit your thumb with a spanner and you get all really angry and flustered about it, then you, you often find that it becomes even harder to finish fixing the tap because you're angry and frustrated. So it's hard to concentrate and do the job. You want to throw the spanner across the room. Now, a leaking tap is easy to fix compared to, uh, it's only a, a broken tap. It's fairly simple. Uh, it's a much simpler problem than fixing a broken relationship or a broken society. 
there's a vastly more complex problem. So if we can, if we struggle even to fix a broken tap when we get angry, how are we going to fix broken relationships or broken societies if we allow anger to guide us? We can't think clearly. Um, Socrates and Plato's Republic uh, in book 10. Uh, so maybe a lot of people don't get to that. It's the last book. They, you know, they give up before they get to that part. But he's, Plato portrays Socrates saying that uh, becoming up distressed uh, or angry or upset prevents the very thing that's most required in the face of misfortune, he says to Glaucon. And Glaucon says, well, what's that, Socrates? And Socrates says it's to think rationally mm -hmm. and clearly about the problem we're facing. Like he's, he's crystal clear that when we grieve excessively, as he puts it, we get passionate and upset. We can't think clearly, and that's the very thing that's most required in the face of a crisis, often. Uh, I'll give you another good example of this that I like to give people about anger. Um, so people will, will sometimes say, you need anger to defend yourself. Mm. If you're being attacked, for example. But actually, people have spoken to who are martial arts experts or boxers or guys who work in security. Well, or who do dangerous jobs will often say, actually, getting angry is extremely unhelpful in these situations. Mm -hmm. It prevents you from uh, defending yourself or other people tactically. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you uh, might, for example, if you get really angry, you might be focused more on inflicting pain on the other person. Whereas if you're keeping your cool and thinking tactically, you might be more focused on getting other people to safety or in disarming the other person. Um, you know, rather than punching them in the nose, you should be trying to get the knife out of their hand, mm -hmm. for instance, and you have to keep a cool head in order to do that. Anger can misguide us to take the wrong course of action mm -hmm. in a threatening situation. And a, a good example would be the rumble in the jungle, where Muhammad Ali uh, fought George Foreman, and Muhammad Ali thought, he's a big man, he's stronger than me, how am I going to beat him? And Ali's conclusion was that George Foreman's greatest weakness was his anger, mm -hmm. and uh, Ali taunted him from the start of the fight and tried to provoke him and make him angry because he believed that by keeping his own cool and making George Foreman angry, he'd make him more vulnerable and easier to defeat in the fight. And that's what happened. Uh, George Foreman got really angry and he uh, exhausted himself early in the fight by throwing too many punches. And he also exposed himself to risk. Uh, he didn't keep his guard up. So we underestimate risk the angrier we get. And so, Ali strategically used Foreman's anger in order to defeat him. It made him more vulnerable. It didn't help him in a dangerous situation. It made him weaker rather than stronger, paradoxically. Yeah. And uh, I think that the, the Stoic's main point is that anger almost inherently impairs our ability to employ reason, mm -hmm. and that's extremely dangerous, uh, contrary to what, what Aristotle appears to have said. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a very good analogy. That because if a person, right, has never, you know, learned any martial arts and not, not very good at martial arts, he doesn't know. So he has no other choice but, you know, rely on instinct when there is a, a fight mm -hmm. or something. Now, for that person, getting angry might be useful, actually. But then the idea is if you train, though, right, if you do learn martial arts, then anger will be unnecessary and it will be much better for you not to rely on anger and be more rational or calm and collected during, during the fight. So this training part, right, is essential mm. uh, in Stoicism. I'll give you another example that Marcus Aurelius alludes to. There's a passage of, uh, in the meditations, if I remember rightly, uh, uh, uh, it's a passage that's easily overlooked. And he says something very nuanced, which I think must arrive from other authors. Um, and he says, um, this must have been a Roman military cliche that uh, for a soldier, anger is just as dangerous as fear. Um, mm. So people think soldiers need to be brave and courageous. And, and some soldiers, we know, uh, Marx Aurelius' critics made a virtue out of anger. Uh, they thought uh, anger was manly. And, and Marx says, no, it's, it's stupid and dangerous because a legionary who gets angry um, would be inclined to rush at the enemy and break formation. And in doing that, he endangers the other soldiers that he's fighting alongside. Um, and so he would be punished by his centurion for doing that. 
because it would be a stupid and dangerous thing to do. And so he says um, soldiers who get angry and break formation are as bad as soldiers that turn around and try to run from the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Anger is just as risky in these situations uh, as as fear. It exposes your your comrades uh, to to danger uh, by compromising the, the formation that you're trying to hold. Yeah. So I will make a political-ish uh, comment right now, because now, um, so being emotional, right, in our culture, so in, in general, when people talk about being emotional, they are to to talking about you know, crying and, you know, showing fear and things like that. But getting angry is not count, doesn't count as emotion. So, for example, if a man uh, hits a woman, right, and the woman cries, now, woman is being emotional or yells at the woman and the woman cries. Mm -hmm. so, and then the, the, but because anger is, seen as manly you know so we do yeah. don't call that man as emotional but he is being emotional right so the emotion is more like uh, feminine and masculine varieties and the masculine varieties they for some reason in culture do not count that much as uh, you know pathological such as marcus talks about this specifically he says people see anger as manly but he says i think the opposite i think it's more manly to have mastered your anger and overcome it so is that I think having the strength of character to exhibit uh, kindness and self-discipline uh, yeah. and temperance is more manly than, than giving way to anger is weakness, uh, ultimately, and it and endangers both you and the people that you care about. Um, so that's a very radical, paradoxical view. And I think it's clear, actually, that other people disagreed with him about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he explicitly uh, says this in the, in the meditations. And he's right, it does require strength, uh, strength of character, a different sort of strength um, to rise above our anger and transcend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the also, um, so we said there is this uh, practice part. So because when, when, when uh, Stoics say these negative emotions, we don't need them. Actually, they are making us irrational. So it is better if we don't have them or we minimize them. Now, this is sometimes understood as we should suppress them, right? Mm -hmm. you, you said uh, the propotei and also so, so this, uh, there's this biological reflex kind of thing. It yeah. happened. Mm -hmm. But then this is not about suppressing, right? They're not talking about suppressing it, but it's more like becoming no. a person who doesn't. Yeah. Uh, they, they never really refer, um, maybe perhaps kind of fleetingly, um, but really they're, they're not really referring to what we would call repressing or suppressing emotions um, because they have this cognitive model of emotion that they believe emotions are based rightly. Uh, it, this is the basis of the model that we use in modern cognitive therapy. There are many, many research studies that, that lend support to this view today. That, uh, um, let me put it this way. Um, the, one of the pioneers of cognitive therapy, Albert Ellis, uh, when clients come into therapy, they will usually talk about their anger, their fear, their sadness, and they'll talk about the impact that has on them. So usually it, they're very depressed, they're very angry, they're very anxious. It, it may be affecting their physical health. It might be affecting their performance at work. It might be damaging their relationship. It's causing them a lot of long-term suffering. It's been getting worse and worse over the years. And when someone talks like that, they reach a point where they've now given themselves many, many reasons to change. But then they'll say, but I can't change. And so they will do what we call expressing stuckness. They'll now say, you know, I, despite all of this, uh, all these many reasons to change, I can't change. Uh, I can't help it. It's mm -hmm. just the way I feel. Mm -hmm. And then Ellis would lean forward and smile at them and say, yes, but it's not just the way you feel, is it? It's also the way that you think. Because thinking and feeling are not two completely separate things. They're very closely related, maybe two sides of the same coin. So the Stoics knew this. Um, it, it, Plato, arguably, was one of the, the, the authors who encouraged this kind of dichotomy between reason and the passions, which is perhaps a false dichotomy that's embedded in our folk psychology today. Like we, we're all, our, our very language is kind of Cartesian dualism, but our very language also makes this distinction between reason and the emotions, which is perhaps a false dichotomy. And the, the, so the Stoics said that, no, the, the, the passions are cognitive in nature. Um, they, they're based upon beliefs. And so, for example, the modern cognitive model of anxiety says that in many cases, anxiety consists in believing that something catastrophically bad or threatening 
um, is about to happen and that you won't be able to cope with it. Something awful is about to happen and I won't be able to cope. So it's a high appraisal of the probability and severity of threat and a low appraisal of our coping ability. So we can define the, the cognitive infrastructure of, of, of, uh, uh, of our anxieties. And, uh, but if those beliefs change, if I think, well, hang on a minute, in fact, this thing that I was worried about, I now realize is never going to happen. Or even if it did, it wouldn't actually be that bad. Mm -hmm. Or even if it did, I know how to deal with it and mm -hmm. survive it. And I'm confident I'd be able to do that. Now, if those beliefs change, then perhaps after a delay, the, our feelings will change, our emotions will tend to, to change. Um, for example, if you are late for a really important job interview and you get caught in traffic and, and you're now really, really late for it, you might become really upset, really, really anxious about that because uh, you believe that there's a high probability that of some threat you're going to miss out on, on this opportunity and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but suppose you realise that your watch is wrong and you are in fact uh, early for the, the job interview. You've made a mistake about it. Now, it may take you a little while to calm down, but because you've now realised you were mistaken, your anxiety doesn't make sense anymore and it's, it's almost certainly going to dissipate after a short delay. Um, in the same way, you're lying, the example that Aaron Beck gives, one of the founders of cognitive therapy, you're lying in bed at night and you hear footsteps outside mm -hmm. and you wake up and think it's a burglar or something like that, you're terrified, you go out and check and you realise it's just your dog or, or something like that. And now, you, again, it might take you a while to adjust, but your anxiety will go away mm -hmm. because you realise that you were mistaken about the threat. So there's a sense in which our emotions are obviously cognitive in nature. Mm -hmm. And when we change our beliefs, our emotions will tend to change. And that's the really the, the basis of, of all uh, cognitive uh, cognitive therapy. Yeah, yeah. And, and you said the essence of uh, stoicism, we can say the, uh, the, the importance of virtue, right? Virtue is the only really important thing. And then if someone realizes this, then they can ask, uh, what if I lose my job? What if that happens? What if uh, I lose my health? Or would that make me a bad person, right? Because virtue mm -hmm. is the only important thing. So would that really harm me, you know, really? And, and uh, they, then, then they would realize that no. So then, as you said, it's like realizing yeah. that well, that sound was no, no one. Someone who tries to suppress their emotions would be like someone who still believes that it's a catastrophe, if uh, if people laugh at them, um, but they try nevertheless not to feel that way. Whereas the Stoics would say, no, no, no, no, you're going about this the wrong way. What you should what you should be aiming to do is to realize that it's not a catastrophe in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like it's your beliefs that you should change, and your emotions will change the consequence. Whereas when we talk about someone having a stiff upper lip, or, or or which is what people mean when they say Stoicism in English with a lowercase s. Um, their beliefs haven't changed. They still think uh, it's a terrible thing that someone has insulted them or that they've lost their job or they've lost some money or something. They just try to get rid of the feelings. Um, that's not what the Stoics are suggesting that they do. The Stoics are suggesting something more radical and fundamental, which is that, in fact, you realise that these things are not catastrophic in the first place. So we are out of time, but I want to ask one last question. I think it is important. So now we are, it's, it looks like Stoics focus on themselves mostly, right? So their own mind, their own perception and all that. Uh, now there, there are also external things and there are injustices, for example. So then what mm -hmm. they are saying is, uh, is it that, okay, we shouldn't care about them or we shouldn't think that it's a catastrophe, so we should be okay with them. So what's their approach there? Well, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius I would say in some respects is a book about anger, but perhaps even more so, it's also a book about justice. Mm -hmm. And Marcus, unsurprisingly, given that he's a Roman emperor, is very concerned with the concept of justice and with cosmopolitanism, our connection with mm -hmm. the rest of mankind. And not only, interestingly, this should be striking to us, he, he very seldom refers to Roman citizens or subjects in that book. He, he, he talks about other human beings in general as, yeah. and seeing them as his brothers and sisters, which is a remarkable thing for him to have written on the 
Danube frontier, when he was meeting with what the Romans called barbarian or foreign uh, chieftains every day, he must be referring to his enemies, the Marcomanni and the Quadi, and the Sarmatians, when he says that you should see these men as your brothers and your kin mm. and not be alienated from them. He doesn't say only Roman citizens, he says everybody. Mm. Uh, he's in the middle of a war and he's talking also um, about his enemies. So Marcus is very, very interested in how we relate to other people individually and other races, nations and society as a whole and how we view our position within the human race in its totality. And the Stoics say virtue is the only true good, it's the most important thing. One of the main virtues is justice, or the kaiosune, um, it really means social virtue, virtue exemplified in our relationship with other people. Um, you know, to, to be virtuous is to interact with other people in a just, fair and benevolent manner. And so the Stoics have this kind of paradoxical view that um, because we don't completely control the outcome of our actions, we must see that as a goal towards which we work. So the Stoics want to bring about uh, or work towards an ideal republic. Mm -hmm. uh, Marcus says that the thing that he values most is the freedom of all of his uh, subjects, the, the, the ideal for a, a state. But he also says that the, we can only work towards the ideal republic one small step at a time, and we should be satisfied if we make gradual progress towards it. Um, so the Stoics do believe that we should work towards a better society for everybody. They want humanity to live in harmony, and they have this ideal um, of the ideal republic. But they accept that it's not entirely under their control. They're kind of realistic about the, the, the limit, their limited ability. Even the Roman Emperor, well, this is maybe a digression, but I, Marcus, I think, had far less uh, uh, freedom to bring about these changes than many people would assume. As the most powerful man in the world, um, you know, something like a quarter of Roman emperors were assassinated. And, uh, he faced a civil war. So, you know, for example, some people say, why didn't he abolish slavery? Well, he would have woken up dead the next morning, you know. He, uh, he, can't, he couldn't just, uh, you know, change the whole of society in the... Uh, in the Battle of Night. He probably didn't agree with many aspects of Roman society, but was forced to, to uh, resign himself to making more gradual changes in order to make any changes at all. And yet, um, so the Stoics think the main thing that is under our control is our intention to do good and to work towards a just society. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, although the external outcome might not be under our control. And in fact, we may fail miserably in achieving it. Nevertheless, we would consider somebody to be a good person if they tried their best to yeah. work towards a just society. We can we consider that admirable and heroic. Um, and so the Stoics think that's really the essence of the good life, yeah. uh, is to do your best to work for justice uh, and, yeah. you know, uh, fate willing. Uh, accept uh, mm -hmm. that you might make some progress uh, while acknowledging that uh, it's always possible that you'll be thwarted by external events. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we yeah, I think uh, I think it's time. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining me here, and I, I, I think this was very beneficial for the uh, listeners. Um, I hope to see you again uh, in the future. Uh, I, I always enjoy, so we did uh, something like this before with uh, Berat, nice. our student, uh, Angel uh, Analytic Philosophy uh, Journal. Um, I, I hope to do this kind of thing later uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure once again. Uh, yeah, and I hope we get, oh, like you, we, we get a, a chance to, to speak once again in the future about philosophy.